get started. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome to another Cooper the Band interview. Apparently, a Cooper the Band podcast, if you will. <laughs> I am here with our drummer, the illustrious, the amazing Will. The band, What's up? How's it going, dude? Man behind the beat. So, yeah. just give you give you a little bit of a forward will is not only an amazing drummer but he is a trained actual percussionist he does it just play drum kit you could ask you could throw him on pretty much anything that can make a beat and he'll just rock your world with it <laughs> well thanks man i appreciate that yep he's also apparently the most musically knowledgeable member of the band so him but, uh <laughs> i don't know if i would agree with that but i'll take it i guess i think you always show i think when it definitely when it comes to like theory and like knowing chord changes, you know, like it's another language. That's all you, my dude. That's a hundred percent you. Yeah, I, I would yeah. say that, but I would enough of, enough of me talking. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your role within the band. Yeah. So, um, I, I joined the band, I guess we all kind of did in 2015 as the, uh, as the drummer. And, um, there's a there's kind of a like a misconception i guess that drummers are called dumbers and you know it's always just like a big joke of us oh, he's just the drummer he's dumb but there people what people really don't understand is like there's a lot of things that i'm thinking about that no one else on stage is thinking about that if somebody weren't things would not go right um and that's not me like tooting my own horn that's just the role of a drummer like Right. Okay. A doctor's role is to help people. A surgeon's role is to do surgery to fix people. A drummer's role is to rock. Well, not rock, but I guess it is rock, but to guide the band and stay on time. Right. And that's, that's the sole like point of being a drummer. Guide the band, stay on time. Okay. So when I first joined, we kind of established that I was the quote unquote band director. And I mean, there are tons of bands who like the drummer is the band leader. So he's the one that is kind of in charge of like getting rehearsals together, uh, staying on task in those rehearsals. Um, while you're playing, he's, he's usually in charge of like guiding everyone. If there's a click and cue involved, typically he's the drummers or she, excuse me, they are the ones that are uh, kind of running that and, Oftentimes there'll be a talk back microphone that only the band can hear. So if the drummer wants to change it up, you know, change up some things a little bit and make it a little jazzier compared to how they usually do it. Typically they can call that out and just on the fly make changes that way. Uh, and then if the band follows a drummer, it's usually going to be a pretty dope show uh, if it's all done properly. And we've had so, some shows because we followed you. <laughs> thanks, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about your musical background. Like what? Gets yeah. You so I, uh, it's kind of a weird, funny story. I started music because I very much did, uh, did not, sorry, I saw, saw something shiny in my beard. Uh, I did not like, uh, my art class in sixth grade. I was not a fan of the teacher. She was always mean. I'm not going to say any names, but all you Dyer County people out there, you'll know who I'm talking about if you went to Northview. <laughs> um, and I was not a fan of this teacher, um, but the way my middle school was set up, is you could do um, the normal exploratory is what they called it. So my middle school was on block schedule. And during the exploratory time, you would either do uh, PE, technology, or art. And... We were on nine-week schedules, so whatever you did the first nine weeks, you would do the last. So my sixth grade year, I had art, then technology, then PE, and then art again, and then that was the school year. Well, having my least favorite teacher twice in one year, it didn't bode very well for me. I was not a fan of it. But I learned that if you joined um, either choir or uh, marching band or concert band, um, you didn't have to do any of it. You just went to that. So when I learned that, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm very musical. I don't really know what music is. I listen to it on the radio, but I don't really know anything about it. But, you know, we'll give it a shot. So I went to the audition process, and um, out of the 10 people, 11 people who auditioned, 
uh, I was the only one who can keep my right foot tapping quarter notes. I didn't know what a quarter note was at the time, but my hands could be playing a very simple rhythm, but I didn't like mess anything up. And I did two or three of those examples and each one got like progressively harder with the pattern I was playing in my hand, playing in my hand. And, um, the band director was like, Hey, yeah, you, uh, <laughs> you should do percussion. And I was like, cool. What's that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So, uh, you know, he explained to me it's, it's drums, you know, and I was like, oh, heck yeah. And obviously my brain was like, I can be a rock star. That'd be dope. That'd be so much fun. So then I go home with those, you know, rock star dreams. And my mom was like, absolutely not. No, you're, of course, not going to do drums or percussion. So I pulled the old uh, parent trap switcheroo. And I, well, I guess a better example is the episode of The Office where Dwight gets people to sign a petition that he's written for something but he puts another piece of paper on top of it so he gets them to sign multiple you know i'm talking about have you seen, have you seen that episode I'm pretty well, that's what i did to my mom and when the band director called her the next day to say you know thanks for signing him up that's when she found out that that sheet was a permission permission slip to join band and as a percussionist yeah. and she was not ha- not happy with me at all because she thought that I was doing like saxophone or clarinet or something like that. And um, so that was a very interesting conversation when mom realized that. And I got home that afternoon and she was like, hey, so yeah, you're playing drums. What's going on there? So I explained that. It was, it was interesting. But things kind of just took off from there. She obviously let me play. Um, percussion I ended up getting a electronic drum set for Christmas like the year a year later Um, and then eventually I got a a real kit which is actually the kit that we when we first started playing together that's the one I was using and um, so yeah things kind of just went from there and then my senior year of high school I um, started taking percussion lessons from uh, a friend of mine who was, who was in college and obviously older, but he was going to the University of Tennessee at Martin, and they had a an amazing, still have, but they, at the time they had an, an amazing percussion program. And the thing, thing about percussion is, like, it's not, like Joe said earlier, it's not just drum set. Like, there's marimba, there's vibraphone, there's concert percussion, you know, there's marching band, there's all kind of things and any, like a percussion instrument is considered anything you can strike scrape or scrape i said that wrong cut that out a percussion instrument is anything you can strike shake there we go or scrape so like hitting your sister is technically considered a percussion instrument <laughs> and i never did that claire would my sister would probably deny that say i did but um For legal reasons yeah. than that. <laughs> do it for legal reasons, you've never done that. Right, right. No, no, never, <laughs> of course. Um, so, yeah, things just kind of went from there. And uh, I ended up auditioning for UT Martin's percussion studio. Uh, don't know how I got it, but I got in. And then that's kind of when I learned how to become a w- more well-rounded percussionist. And, um, you know, I learned way more about marimba and vibraphone and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's when I learned theory. You know, it took four years of theory um lots of lots of different kinds of instruments so like my major was music education so i had to learn how to play trumpet and trombone and saxophone and bassoon which is the hardest all props to all the people who out, out there who can play bassoon you guys are beasts i can never do it but um so yeah that, those uh four and a half years that i was in school um really kind of shaped obviously where i'm at now learned it learned a ton and uh, I was able to retain a ton so I can utilize it for what we're doing and, you know, what I'm doing outside of Cooper the Band. Mm-hmm. Cool. So talking about utilizing what you do for Cooper the Band. Yeah. We were, in this, we were kind of in the midst of a quarantine or we were kind of going into it because when we started recording stuff, it started out with a demo. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a year process. Cooper wrote the song. It was, what was it, 2019 because I'm bad at math. It's 2020. <laughs> So 2019. Um, I, think the, uh, I think the initial idea, like Cooper had the, I think if I remember correctly, he had the lyrics written and like a very basic understanding of how he kind of wanted it to flow. Um, 
and we started, I know we were driving back from South by Southwest in March of, I think, I guess it was 2019. Yeah, yeah it was. Cause it, was, it, was yeah. it was the second time we went to Austin. Yeah, second time. And uh, I remember I was driving in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas, the entire state. And um, <laughs> we... Uh, I saw North Arkansas is actually really beautiful. Yeah, it is. It really is. Uh, I want to say I remember you taking your laptop and your MIDI keyboard out and kind of plugging them up and, you know, just coming up with different chord changes. And I want to say at some point I, I gave you, like, I tapped something out on the steering wheel and you kind of replicated that on the MIDI keyboard. And uh, we kind of just got, like, a very basic understanding of how we wanted it to flow. Mm -hmm. And then I guess a month or so later we got together and um, – more of the lyrics for like verse two were written. And then I know in July of 2019, we uh, shout out to Kathy Brown, Cooper's mom. She allowed us to kick her out of her house for a weekend at the lake in Lexington. And um, we kind of took over her entire house as like a rehearsal space. And um, we were able to rehearse, write new stuff, um, go out on the boat, which was super fun. <laughs> Um, and I think that's really kind of where the legs of the song of stuck came, kind of came to fruition. And, uh, we really put in a lot of work that weekend to kind of nail down the way we wanted it to go. But yeah, moving into, I guess, right before quarantine, I think it was probably like January, early February, mm -hmm. whenever we, uh, did the demo right. for demo drums for stuck. And I remember you and I thinking, well, this won't probably won't be the like final drums you know this is just a good uh, do what this will never make it to the record no <laughs> it was literally us uh yeah we just we were like well this is just an idea so i know i brought in my uh spdsx uh drum pad and i kind of tapped out an idea that i had and we kind of went with it and then i went into the drum booth and recorded uh the drums again not really thinking this is the final product and us thinking, well, you know, Kyle's going to hear it. He's going to like some of it. Probably. He probably won't like some of it. And we'll, we'll reassess whenever we get his opinion on it. And then the fact that he was like, yep, these are dope. Um, we're not even going to sample anything. Um, the drums sound huge and that's exactly what the song needs. I know you and I both were texting about it. Like what? Did, like, we, we, we made it sound good. You made it sound good, but I was like, we, we weren't really expecting these drums, these sounds to be the final product. And lo and behold, they were, yeah, that, so was, that was, that was kind of cool. That was, that was, that was strange because like, that was our first time kind of as a band, kind of like, kind of like recording on our own, just ch doing some things together. Like every time we've yeah. been in the studio, we've been with Kyle. Mm -hmm. If y'all, if you might remember from the last interview, the two interviews ago, now, Kyle uh, lives in Nashville, and me and Will, we live in Jackson, Tennessee. So we got together. Oh, we well, got a little plug there. I see you. <laughs> yeah, you sure some fly, by the way. Yeah. But we, um, you and I, we got together. It was you, me, Cooper was in Jackson. I think he was working on something. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time so we decided to go into a studio and we were just going to do demo work yeah we were just going to do like we're going to we were going to lay the foundation of the song of what we as the band as the artist thought of the song and then pitch it to the producer be like okay how do we make this a thing yeah we weren't expecting to keep any of the tracks praying hoping that we would but we weren't expecting to keep any of the tracks yeah. then kyle texted us and said yeah i'm keeping all of this and <laughs> when you and I kind of retext each other almost every month about it too. Yeah, we really do. It's it's like it's like uh, remember that time that we did that? <laughs> We're like, what? Think, yeah. I think the coolest thing about that is the fact that we did it all remote. You know. Yeah. And I know for a while you you kind of pitched the idea of like you know we have access to you know plenty of equipment. We have friends that can help us out in studios and stuff in Jackson. So there's not really much of a, a major need for us to always all be in the same building at the same time to do it. And I, you know, you're going to say, I told you so, but for some reason I just didn't think that was going to work. And I, I don't know why, maybe I'm a control freak. Actually, I know I'm a control freak. 
And I was like, that's just not, it's not going to bode well. Um, clearly I was wrong and I'll admit that I was wrong. Um, so I think that kind of like opened up a new lane for us to really start utilizing that. Cause you know, like if you guys are fans and you're watching, like you'll probably know that Matt Cooper and Phoebe all live in middle Tennessee. And like Joe said earlier, Joe and I live in Jackson about two hours away, two and a half hours, depending on what part of Nashville you're talking about. And, um, it's not easy all of us getting a weekend free or a week free to go and hang out and do rehearsing and stuff. So the fact that we were able to make this um, demo, then full blown song the way we did, even before quarantine started happening, I think it was kind of a testament to how much we wanted it to be a thing and how much we wanted to continue doing things. And, um, I'm just glad you took charge, Joe, and started, you know, pushing us and pushing us and pushing us to do it. And uh, obviously it worked out. So I, thank you for your pers persistence on that. I, I try. But also going back, you were talking about being a control freak. First of all, you guys don't understand. <laughs> Bill is the drummer on and off stage. And he is a bit of a control freak, but it works in our favor, if that makes sense. You know how... You know how you, there's always that one person that's leading you, whether it's your older sibling, your parents, or whatnot. And yeah, it could be a bit much, but they're almost always like always right all the time. You're like, I need this in my life. That is Will. That is Will because he he when we're on stage, he's he literally knows the song better than anybody. As far as like, here's where we're at. Here's yeah. where we're going to. There was one time we were playing a we were playing a show. I'm not going to say which one, but it was one of our biggest shows. You know exactly what it is. Oh, we man. started out with Mercy. Yep. And yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> I, we love Cooper, but he started, for, for you mus musician nerds, he started the song, I believe, a beat early. Oh, this was, yeah. Okay. So this was our, uh, our fundraiser show for Canada back in January of like 2018, I believe. Yeah, and it was literally one beat early. Like most bands who are uh, doing, well, really all bands now um, are using click and cues, at least a minimum click, and we utilize click and cues all the time. And the little dude in our ears that said verse two, three, four, mm -hmm. Cooper heard verse two, three now. Yeah. And he, he jumped a beat. Um, so I think where you're going with that is – Everyone knew what was wrong immediately. Cooper knew something was wrong immediately. And all eyes just like turned to me and they were like, Oh, what do we do? We're in the middle of the beginning of our show. What's happening. And like, I don't know how I visually said it, but I was like, calm down. I've got this. Just trust me. And whenever we were supposed to go into the correct part of the song, I guess I did a feel and I made it insanely obvious where we were. And it all ended up lining up. You, you did like you did. It was kind of like a fill, but it was also like a. I don't want to say double because it wasn't like a heel toe, but it was like a ta da shh. Like yeah. it crashed. You you emphasized the one with the crash, yeah. and I was like, I love this man. Right. <laughs> it was the most like for for anyone who is a musician, just like knowing where you're at, and then if, you know how sometimes you might play a show, and for some odd reason, people get lost. Will reigned us in like that. And it was funny because you we were talking about it afterwards. You're like, dude, I had no idea what I was gonna do there, but I was like, <laughs> I, I have to do my job. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so funny. And it's it's things like that that um uh, make Will so special and integral to the band because you can get a drummer who can play on time, but they are the ones, even if they aren't the band director, they're the ones that are leading the song because they establish where everything is at where yeah. the tempo is at, what the feel is at. Bass player helps too, but that's where that's that's the drummer's job. And so kind of like going back to recording because we were we, we were we did not know what we were doing. We were kind of experimenting. I mean I've recorded a lot because it was a studio I work at. You know, you've recorded already with Kingdoms, but we didn't know what well, in this specific instance, we didn't know what we were gonna do because we one, we didn't have Kyle. Mm -hmm. you know, it was like at home, first time mowing the yard, and your parents <laughs> Dad's at work. You, yeah. yeah, you know exactly. He says, "Yeah, just yeah. do." It. So we were in there creating, and you know, 
threw you in in the booth, so threw you in there to record. So tell us about that, like, in just in general. Yeah, what's it like for you recording, especially since you and I have talked about how you had a more classical background and not a more commercial background. Yeah, especially um, in terms of. School. I definitely would say it's uh, well, obviously different than like the classical side of things. Now, do recordings happen in classical music? Yeah, of course they do. That's how you get all the scores for music and all that kind of stuff. Or excuse me, scores from movies. Movies. I can't speak. Scores from movies and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when I first, I guess the first time I went into the recording studio, I was really intimidated because there were a lot of ears, microphones, things that could hear the specifics of what I was doing on me that were going to be playing everything that I did over and over again. So it was almost like a, just a, a, a thought in the back of my head saying, hey, man, don't mess up. Hey, man, don't mess up. Stay relaxed, but don't mess up. Everyone's going to know, and they're going to know it m- multiple times over and over again. So even like, I've, I guess I've been recording stuff now for probably five years since we've been to the band. And even now, like Joe, you and I had a recording session this past weekend. And even then I walked in and we were with some guys who are insanely talented and very well established here in Jackson. And I was like, oh gosh, dude, you can't afford to mess this up. You have, you have to be on. I mean, it took me a minute to get there, but once we got there, I felt like we were there and it felt, it felt really solid. But yeah, I mean, I guess that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's kind of what I was feeling whenever we went into um, the session to record stuck was even though Kyle's not in, not in the room, he's going to hear this. So again, don't mess up. Right. You know, we can punch things if we need to, and that's going to be fine, but I would much rather just get it right the first time and then have everything synced up and, you know, sounding good and, putting our best foot forward, even our better foot forward, I guess, because Kyle's not here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to prove to him that we could do it and just send it to him later and not have to necessarily have him in the studio. Obviously we want him all the time whenever he's available, but it wasn't, uh, I think I was trying to prove to myself that it wasn't exactly a necessity every single time. So that was kind of the mindset that I had going into that session and I know we didn't, like, I'd practiced a couple of days before, probably two or three days every single day before we recorded, uh, of me just trying to get the beat down. Um, because, like, for the most part, say in the chorus, I'm playing a lot of hi-hat stuff. Right. But my kick pattern, if you listen to the kick drum pattern, it's not exactly the most um, normal that you would hear on a, on a pop song, pop rock song. Um I guess you would consider that pop rock. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, it's pretty syncopated. So every time that we were playing that, and they're the, you know, the big hits that the whole band does. Yeah. In addition to what I'm doing. So there's a lot of different, like, syncopation, syncopated notes that are happening. So, I mean, I spent several hours just making sure that I had my part down. That way that, you know, whenever it's recorded, and we're, you know, fast forward a couple of months, we're playing it live. I have my part down. Then if I need to like visually or audibly help somebody with their part, I can. So that's, that's kind of where, I guess, where I started at that session of like practice several days beforehand, went into it with fresh ears, obviously went in, you, you and Cooper, and I think it was just us three there that night. Um, you know, I got y'all's input on it. And change a few things, not enough to make it to where the practice was use, uh, useless, but uh, change a few things and then like lock everything in. And it clearly turned out pretty good. Right. So that kind of gives me, it's not one of my listed questions, but it kind of gives me a thought, um, especially when you're talking about your kick pattern and mm-hmm. the rhythm and the feel of the song. So again, kind of going on to music nerd world, me and Kyle would, would nerd out about, production techniques and stuff like that when me and will are talking we kind of go into like theory land and this 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 modulation or you know how we how this polyrhythm and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so the song is basically in two four pretty much yeah but most of the time until the final chorus 
And I mean, technically, you could write it in two four, but it's pretty much yeah. four for the rest of the song. Yeah. So we have a lot of music like that with a lot of different time changes because Cooper feels rhythm a lot differently. A fiend and a fool, and I love him for it. <laughs> you hate him and you love him for it. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Yes. He'll, he'll throw you an idea. You'll be like, this is a lot of work I got to do. And then you do it. It was like, I was challenged. Yes. <laughs> like yeah. that's literally your thought. So it was stuck. And it wasn't ex- extremely complex, but stuck had a lot of syncopated hits that mm-hmm. we don't always get to do. And it was yeah. different for us. So when, especially with, especially with stuck, um, you can go with any song that we do, but writing drum parts, like what was your mindset? Uh, and not everybody thinks about writing drum parts. Sometimes people just think, oh, just a beat. You know, yeah. I've done this too. Sometimes I've just thrown, I've thrown you into, I've kind of thrown you into the wolves a couple of times when you and I have just recorded personal stuff. But, <laughs> but I also like doing that because I know you and I know you. I like it when you react. Yeah, <laughs> just want but, to get a reaction out of me. Exactly. But seriously, recording stuck or writing the drum parts and having the idea how what goes in your mind when doing that. And I'm pretty sure you kind of answered it with the previous questions, but. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that at my job as a drummer, okay, say I was only doing music uh, as a hired gun and I wasn't in a, in a band. Like I was playing for different bands, but I was not an official member. The number one rule is serve the song. It's just how it is. You know, if you're, if you're going to play a country song, you don't need to be playing blast beats that you play in a metal song. You know, it just, it doesn't fit. You don't need that. And honestly, in that context, it sounds bad. Um, so thinking, I always kind of take that approach when it comes to writing for us as well. Um, and because, and I love him to death, but because Cooper feels rhythms differently than I do, than you do, um, I try to make it, insanely obvious where the downbeat is that's kind of like i guess maybe maybe one of the main things that i try to think about and um i guess yeah when writing this song i was trying to think all right uh the bam 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 it that didn't feel it was hard to feel where one was so those those some back and forth with me and Cooper of like, all right, bam, 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 one, two, three, four, one, two, bam, 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 one, two, three. Right. So once we kind of established that, it honestly made my job a lot easier, and I feel like it just the flow of the song started happening a little better. And because I think originally the idea was to like cut out two more two beats previous to when we established that. And that just wasn't feeling right. You know, I I think the ultimate uh, goal is to, one, make people feel loved and appreciated through our music. And, you know, if there's issues going on at home, they'll forget about them for the length of a song, the length of a show. I think that's not our number one goal. But overall, as a musician, most musicians' number one goal is to make people dance, make people have fun. Can't really do that if you have some wacky time signature changes that we somehow always do, but always make it groove. And I don't get it. Like, I don't really understand how we're able to do that. I'm very thankful we have that innate ability to, to, make, to make that happen. But that was also an, another thing that I was thinking of. It's like, well, the way it is at the moment might not make people dance. And I don't really think a song that people would dance to specifically but i was trying to think in those terms and um once we kind of made a bit of a change and made it flow a little better i was like yeah this is this is this is it this is the beat um so yeah cool so you were talking about studio recording you know Mm -hmm. as you've learned not everyone knows how much goes into recording studio work what has helped you grow after experiencing that because i've i've watched i've kind of got an opportunity to watch you grow from going i don't really do studio work this is not my thing to being a little bit more confident you walk in with yeah. a more swagger now you still act like you don't know what you're doing but you actually do and i have to remind you stop it your boss <laughs> you literally told me that stop it be confident the other day yeah because i mean when when 
I'm engineering or producing, I got to be like, hey, you can do this. And you, yeah. you 90% of the time can, and the other 10%, you just need to practice it twice. And so, yeah. so what, has, what, what have you really learned and what would you also pass on to somebody who's trying to get into studio work? Yeah, so I think the one thing that I've learned is, you know, experience is a great teacher, whether that's good experience or bad. I've had some, obviously, some really good experiences in the studio, and there have been several times, even doing stuff with you, that you, Joe, that I've walked out, and I'm like, I did not put my best foot forward on that. Uh, you know, I wasn't feeling it that day. I just, I, you know, I don't, I would rather be at home tonight. You know, I. That's kind of some things that I've felt, but the more I've done it, the more I've realized that, like, this is my job as a drummer is to be solid drive the song, make everyone understand where one is, make people dance. That's, that's my job. And that's kind of one thing that I keep in mind uh, when I'm in the studio as well is, um, you know, really just trying to think of the right way to say it, making sure what I'm doing is coming across the way that I think the artist wants it to come across. And that comes from never being too flashy. You can ask anyone that I know. I'm not really a flashy drummer. I don't play fast. I don't play insanely complicated feels. I, I just don't. But I do feel like I have a pretty solid foundation. And if you want to groove, I got you all day. And that's that might be a little like toot my own horn, but... I've done this for 15 years. You know, I've, if you, you know, if you jog for 15 years and run for 15 years, you're going to be pretty dang good at it. Play guitar. As long as you have Joe, you're going to be pretty dang good at it. You know, it's just, it kind of just comes with the territory. Um, so like I have to tell myself that all the time of like, you do this quote unquote professionally, you get paid to do this. You know, you have to deliver the product as if you get paid to do this. So telling myself that really helps. Um, and I think anyone who's wanting to get started in a studio session, um, give me a call. You know, if you want to come hang out and like sit down and, you know, kind of watch my process or give any drummer that you know who does it a call. Uh, odds are they're going to be completely fine with you coming in and watching. Uh, ask questions. Uh, maybe not in the moment of the recording because you don't want to ruin the recording. But, um, you know, if you see something, you're like, I don't what exactly does that mean or how does that process work? You know, just ask questions. That's how you get better. That's how I, you know, got better. Just by going to studio sessions, um, doing it, doing it badly, and then learning how to fix it. Mm. So. Yeah, just to brag on you a little bit. I remember one time um, we were recording something for the band, but it was just kind of like, I think it was like a track thing. Mm -hmm. I have tracks, uh, like, you know, background tracks. But yeah you were playing and the click went out in your ear <laughs> you sped up just a little bit so at first it was like you were kind of off but then you were consistent with the click at the same time <laughs> oh thanks you were you were like just to brag on will this dude is that consistent and that's why i call him because every every time he's right with the click i you know for all the production production nerds when i edit the drums or i pocket the drums i have no issues because first of all it's there right there i just if anything I have to take his transients move it up a little bit move it back but the dude is real like that much on <laughs> well thanks dude i appreciate that's, that a lot and you know coming from production band member standpoint production standpoint engineering standpoint songwriting standpoint that is the most important thing you can do um as a drummer, just coming coming from the receiving end, not yeah. from the transmitting end. That is the most important thing you could do. And now me, I love flashy drummers. But <laughs> yeah. I, love, I love the flashy drummers I love are the ones that can get back to that groove. Yeah. That that groove is still more important. That uh foundation is more important. It's the most important thing. So always be so no matter how flashy you get, it doesn't matter if you can't stick the landing. Doesn't matter how many flips you do in the air, you don't get the gold medal in the Olympics. <laughs> you don't if you don't stick the landing. That's solid. That's yeah. That's very true. So, uh, we are doing our best to do this full time. 
Yeah, we're working there. We're getting there. We're getting close, but all of us still have jobs. You have a full time job in the midst I of do. Corona. In the midst of Corona. Yeah. One, talk about your full time job. Yeah, sure. If you can. Uh, how and also, how do you balance that and your passion, soon to be career? And what are the steps you take every day to become yeah. a drummer? So my full-time job, I work for West Tennessee Healthcare. Uh, I'm the social media coordinator. So I literally tell people, like, I get to mess around and play around on Facebook all day as my job. You know, that's a millennial's dream come true. Mm -hmm. um, but I do a whole lot more than just that. Um, a major aspect of my job that's kind of come up over the last – almost year is um, I'm hosting a podcast that the hospital has called We Talk Health, which we talk about all kinds of different healthcare things. Um, I am not clinical. I don't know medical things, but I think that's really important for people who would be listening to know because for example, I've done a podcast about diabetes. And, I mean, you, you hear about diabetes, you hear, like, some specifics, but I don't know much about it. So the questions that I ask about diabetes or broken bones or, you know, what it looks like to be um, a medical director of emergency room or whatever, the questions that I try to ask are questions that I think the general public would want to know that might – they might be too – I'd be embarrassed or scared to ask their primary care providers um, because, you know, some questions are just uncomfortable. Right. And I, if I'm able to hear a question that I've always had be answered in, in kind of an, like an anonymous way that makes me feel better about something that I'm, I'm, I might be dealing with. So that's kind of the approach that I take um, to the podcast and, um, found out the other day that since the beginning of February, um, that's when the, the podcast started, found out this out yesterday, actually, um, we reached 5,000 downloads. Mm -hmm. So pretty excited about that. That's kind of a milestone in that endeavor of my career and um, very proud of that. But it's, I was actually having this conversation with my lady friend earlier. Like I get to, at work on my day job, I get to, play around with microphones and recording equipment like for a hospital what who has that opportunity that's not that's kind of a kind of a rare thing so when i when i realized that i could actually do that and i was able to get equipment that you know i could kind of utilize the skills that i've learned outside of work to affect what i'm doing at work it's almost like two worlds kind of married a little bit so i'm insanely fortunate to be able to like I said, play around with microphones and recording techniques and logic and, you know, all these kinds of things for my actual day job, which is pretty cool. Um, so when it comes to balance, it's, that's, that's been a struggle, if I want to be honest with you. Um, Especially now, probably. Yeah. It's, so coronavirus has definitely made the workload increase, and I'm insanely um, thankful I still have, have a job. Uh, I know there's been a lot of people who have been uh, let go or, um, yeah, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Furloughed, that's it, um, because of the virus and specific companies just aren't making money at that moment. So I've had to keep myself in check a lot of like, man, I wish I was at home today. Well, I'm at work making a living. So I'm insanely thankful for that. Um, so this past couple of months has been a little bit easier because of COVID. We have not had nearly as many live band things happening. So I've been able to actually get a little, a little more rest than I guess I'm used to. Um, but like say COVID weren't a thing, uh, by September of this year, we would have already played several shows and I absolutely love it, but it is difficult to work a full-time job get off work and drive immediately three hours to go play a show uh, and then get home at 1, 2 a.m., sleep for a few hours and get up and go to work the next day. It can be, can be rather taxing. Um, but I, I would do it every single day 
because it's it's my passion. It's what I love to do, and um, I'm kind of ready for the world to go back to somewhat normal. You know, for us to get back out on the road again. Um, that's again, that's what I love to do. That's what I, I want to do for for my life. So it's one of the like Cooper says it all the time. Like if you're not willing to treat your passion like a full time job and you want it to become your full-time job, if you're not willing to treat it like it is, it will never become that. So he said that several times, and I've always kind of kept that as like a mantra. So like as much time as I put into my actual day job, I should be putting in that much time per week to what I love to do. Yeah. And that's kind of the, I guess, the mindset that I've had the last five years. Um, now, does it always look perfect? Absolutely not, but we keep on striving we keep, you know, trying to get better every day. Whether that means I'm dr drumming every single day or learning from the best over here, Mr. Joe Kyle, yeah. on recording techniques or watching you run a soundboard and, you know, you don't realize you're teaching me in, in the moment, but I'm watch when I watch you run soundboards, like I'm, I'm absorbing what you're putting down and you, you don't even realize it. Um, so my brain is kind of always like working and looking to learn things so I can then make myself more marketable right. you know, for the future. You'll learn what not to do by watching me. <laughs> I've also learned what to do, which has been a huge help. Making plenty of mistakes. So here's some fun questions. I've got about four left. Okay. It's fun. So this one's just kind of chill though. Name a weird, ooh, never mind. This isn't the chill one, but this is still a good one. Name <laughs> a weird trait or thing you do or have or is part of you that many people may not know. Oh, man. I could think of three. One that's probably the band's favorite, but. All right. What are your three? And then I'll tell you. I'll tell you one. Uh, the list of movies. <sighs> Dang. Yep. Okay. I knew you're going to put me on blast like that. So <laughs> you had to, I know. So yeah, I have an insanely long list of movies that I have not seen. And it's, it's rather embarrassing. Any of my friends that are in the band that have access to that list. I've literally been told, yeah, just go home. Will. it's hard to be friends with you sometimes because you haven't watched these movies. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a pretty big, big one. I guess people wouldn't know. Um, really like disc golf, mm -hmm. um, which I guess some people might know that. But it's. I mean, it's been pretty hot. It's starting to cool off now. Now, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna be and the quarantine, of course. So I haven't really been out and about doing much. But um, disc golf is a really fun way to kind of unwind um yeah how well you take i mean this is kind of obvious but also like not as obvious because we don't think about it mm -hmm. but your luxurious beard <laughs> <laughs> oh this whole thing oh man <laughs> right He's yeah like, that's uh that's in a way that's kind of like a part of who i am now like joe is uh, an amazing guitar player bass player musician that's kind of part of who he is people when they think of me they're like yeah he's got the beard what up and that's what i wanted that's kind of why i wanted to grow up David and because i look like a two-year-old if i don't have it so that's i think actually that's probably the main reason why i grew up here it's more like it's more like a a, a youth youth worship leader or youth worship pastor no that's if i have a just a short goatee oh. <laughs> i have that and then like some cargo shorts, some flip flops, and a polo. I mean, just call me Worship Pastor Will. Oh Lord, <laughs> I re I remember seeing some of that. Yep. <laughs> so not, not a good look. You are very busy. Uh, still trying to do things for the band. Still mm -hmm. working that full time job. When you do get downtime, what is one of your favorite things to do? Um, right now I've, I've kind of discovered a, or rediscovered, I guess, a old love for video games. So when I was a kid, you know, just like almost every, almost 30 year old guy was, um, 
I'm a big fan of Super Smash Brothers. It's a ton of fun. I, My roommates and I. I did not know you play Smash Bros. Every, almost every day. Literally almost every day. If I have any downtime where I don't have something immediately for work or the band I need to get done, we're smashing. It's happening. It's so much fun. My roommate, I don't own it. My roommate has one. He has a Switch, and we, we play it literally almost every day. Um, and if I'm not doing that, I'll have to play Call of Duty. Uh, I'm awful at it. You can ask Kyle, the guy on the podcast, or the episode two episodes ago, uh, and Cooper. I'm, and Joe. I'm terrible. Um, a, but it's a lot of fun. We need to have an episode where we just talk about Call of Duty or something. Just no, like, no, we need to have the episode where we play Call of Duty and somehow oh, scream record all of it. No! <laughs> but like each that. screen in the, in the corners and like see how terrible I do. It'll be a lot of fun. We, you and I would be in the gulag Every the whole time. <laughs> match. Match. It was actually pretty good because he's played a lot more Call of Duty. I, when I did first person shooters, I, I started playing Halo. Yeah. So, you know, he kind of looks down upon me, but you know, he likes. No, no, I, I definitely played Halo. I, I had an Xbox. I was a kid who borrowed my friend's Xbox a lot. I just, I never, so my parents live out in the middle of nowhere and they never had internet. They still, it's 2020, they still don't have internet at their house. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't know I, if that's a good thing or a bad thing, though, because it's 2020. I know. Probably for their mental health, it's probably a great thing. They, like, they must be <laughs> really healthy people on the planet right now. Yeah, right? But um, I was a kid who would borrow my friend's Xboxes that weren't being used for the weekend, and I would just, like, play the campaign of every game as, as, often, as often as I could. Uh, and then when I went to college, you know, I, I eventually bought my own. And then I sold it whenever I joined the band because I just wasn't playing it because we were doing so much stuff. So things kind of calmed down a little bit. I was like, you know what? Playing Xbox would kind of be fun. It'd be kind of a fun way to relive some old childhood fun glory. Mm-hmm. I was never good. good. Still not good, but it's a good time. We well, do all right. And I always bring up Halo and Call of Duty as a joke because – Will had more of a Call of Duty background. Halo, uh, Cooper. I played a little bit of Halo, but Cooper really played Halo back in the day. Yeah, yeah apparently like Cooper it. was like insanely good, and I still don't think he has those chops anymore. So I'm apparently, calling him out. Apparently, on recording. Kyle was insanely good. Like, oh no, I'm not calling Kyle out. He, I know this is good. how he described it. He's. I think he said at one time he was better at Halo than he was at music, which. I think so. Which scares me. That scares me. Right. I want to say that, and I could be wrong on this, but I want to say that Kyle said at one point he was like a, one of the top 100 players in the world, which is insane. I could be way wrong on that. Kyle, if I'm wrong, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. Yes, but I want to say that he, he said he played it so much that he was considered that. Well, next two questions. Yeah. If you could quarantine with any member of the band, who would it be? And why would it be Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would say you, actually. Um, I think, like, we we just naturally get along really well. Not that I don't with the other guys, but there's – I don't know what it is. It, it, and this may be weird to say out loud, but it feels like the big brother, little brother kind of relationship. Kind of. And I'm younger than Cooper and Matt, so I feel like the little brother in that situation – um, but you, in a way, feel like my little brother, and I'm like, I, one, I don't have a little brother, so I gladly accept you. I have one. It's, it's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a fraternity. I have a couple of fraternity little brothers, but blood little brother, I consider that to you. Uh, and, you know, we just we vibe a lot on the same kind of music. Uh, you show me things musically like periphery. They're insane, and I wouldn't know who they are without you, or Animals as Leaders, or all, you know, all these other kind of bands. Snarky Puppy, I heard of them in college, but I've never really listened to them as much as I do now until you started being like, yo, bruh, you got to listen to this dude. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely think it'd be you because if, you know, if we're quarantined together for two weeks, we would be talking about music. We would make fun snacks, probably like chicken wings and mm-hmm. I don't know, you, you claim that you make some really good pork chops. I want to try them sometime. Uh, I grill pretty well. Um, 
you know, I'll make some steak, you know, we'll, we'll make it a thing. Right. And then when we're not doing that, we would just be either playing music or playing video games. And that sounds like the life. That, so. that does sound like the life. <laughs> yeah. When you're talking about it, it kind of like reminds me, that I think this is the best way to describe our relationship, especially within the band. You and I, and this is not like a brag thing. This is just weird. You and I are both the most mature and immature members of the band at the same time. A hundred percent. At a hundred percent. Like just, <laughs> we're the ones that will really, really get stuff done. But all the really yeah. bad 12-year-old jokes, him and I. 20, That's us. 24 like if you if 100%. You, if you see any of band members being really immature, that's us. If you see any <laughs> band members being really mature, us. And it'll happen in a space of five minutes, too. Oh, like, yeah. It's weird. It's strange. Oh, yeah. We can drive from here to Kroger, and that would happen in that, in that drive. All the time. So this is a would-you-rather question. Okay. I might be pulling at your heartstrings a little bit, but... All right. Would you rather switch instruments with another band member... For the rest of Cooper the Bear's duration, like you play guitar, I play drums, or Matt plays plays drums, you play bass, etc., so forth. Or would you rather shave your beard? Oh, dude, that's tough. Oh man, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a caveat. You can regrow it after maybe two years. Dang, I was about to say the beard, but you just threw that at me. Oh man. Um I think I'm still gonna go with beard. Mm-hmm. Um I haven't really told anyone this, and I don't know, like my uncle and I haven't shaken on this, so it might not really actually be a thing. And me saying this, it might be. I'm playing fantasy football this year. I've never done it. But my family likes to talk trash, and I'm in an all-family league. And the other day, I text the the family, and I was like, you guys ready to lose to someone who's never played this before? And my uncle that I used to live with, he uh, he texts back. He was like, all right, bro, you're going to talk all this trash. We'll make a beard bet. If you beat me, I'll grow my beard out. If I, if I win, talking about him, if he wins, I shave my beard. <laughs> yeah well I, I texted him back and i said i'm not sure i'm ready for that kind of commitment yet but <laughs> i uh, i don't know where that's gonna go so i guess it's mm-hmm. it's possible you guys could see me without a beard sometime soon which i would look like a four-year-old i think earlier i said two-year-old four-year-old is probably more accurate um so with that in mind i think i'll say beard Mainly because I I don't know how to play bass or guitar or I can sing a little bit but not nearly on the level as like Phoebe or Cooper, so I'm gonna stick with my drums. You can have my beard. <laughs> <laughs> all <laughs> right. Well, that's all the questions I have, and that's I think that's all the time we have. So thank you, Will. Yeah, dude. Thanks for putting this together. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. This is fun. We need to do this more often. Yeah, we need to do this with you in the hot seat and me hosting. Oh, Lord. I don't know if you we'll want that. Oh, no, I, I definitely do. We'll make that a thing. Oh, Lord. Okay. All right. Well, this is, at least by recording, this is episode three of Cooper the Podcast for the interview. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, dude. Appreciate you, man. Later, man. Bye.